Yeah, this is the most tasteless video I've ever done. In 1984, Ronald Reagan announced the Teacher in Space Project, a program that was meant to put a teacher, the first civilian, out into space. Not only would this give the shuttle program some much-needed publicity, but it also would inspire children to get into those STEM programs. After a year of sorting through thousands of candidates, a winner was decided. Krista McAuliffe, a social studies teacher from New Hampshire. For a few months, McAuliffe was a national star, doing press conferences and talking about her experience. On the day of the launch, classrooms nationwide were tuned in live to watch this historic launch of the Challenger. And then... One minute, 15 seconds. Velocity, 2,900 feet per second. Altitude, 9 nautical miles. Downrange distance, 7 nautical miles. Yeah. The Teacher in Space program didn't succeed in actually getting a teacher into space, but it did succeed in traumatizing millions of school kids around the nation, as well as the friends and family of the astronauts, who did not deserve this fate. The Challenger was a tragic disaster and an optics nightmare for NASA, but it turns out, it could have looked worse. Before there was a plan to send a teacher into outer space, there was an idea to send Big Bird from Sesame Street. Yeah, this isn't a joke. It's real. Look it up. Hey there, wanna lift? Oh, no thanks. I'm on my way to space! The Big Bird plan never went further than just initial discussions. Unsurprisingly, there were a lot of apparent problems with the logistics of the whole thing, considering the space shuttle was built to seat humans and not eight-foot-tall Muppets. I just love that someone at NASA really looked at this giant yellow bird and thought, yeah, I'd shove that on a rocket. So here's an idea, just a thought experiment. What if they did? Say in an alternate timeline, the higher-ups at NASA just really pushed for this idea, and the best and brightest in America put their minds together to shoot Big Bird from Sesame Street into outer space. Hey, who's to say? Maybe they could have done it. They sent men to the moon on technology less advanced than a key fob. Pretty sure those engineers could have figured out how to squeeze this fat bird into a seat. What I'm saying here is that we were only a few key decisions removed from Big Bird dying horrendously in a rocket explosion in front of millions of children live on TV. In an alternate timeline, the Challenger explosion is still a horrendous tragedy where seven real people actually died. It just so happens that one of them is dressed like this. The thing with Muppets is that they aren't treated like puppets. They're treated like real people. When Animal shows up at the Game Awards, nobody is like, oh man, it's the puppeteer playing Animal. No, Jeff Keighley will assuredly stop everything just to go, holy hell, it's Animal, he's here. This means that in the canon of the Muppet universe, and to a lesser extent real life, Big Bird would have died in the Challenger explosion. That would be reality now. And it's not like they can just bring Big Bird back like nothing happened. Jim Henson would retire the character not just out of sheer respect, because holy shit, but because Carol Spinney didn't just play Big Bird. He was Big Bird. The voice, his movements, everything. You know how much work goes into playing a Muppet? It takes like decades of training. They have apprenticeships. They'd have no choice but to retire Big Bird forever. Overall, this entire situation makes the Challenger kind of even more of a PR disaster for the shuttle program. Because yeah, a civilian's death is pretty bad, but NASA dropped the ball so hard they killed a fictional character. Good luck getting them STEM programs now. An absolute Molotov to its reputation. Perhaps this is such an embarrassment it might even cause the program to lose funding. In our timeline following Challenger, they suspended flights for two years. But maybe this would be something that makes it suspended forever. Okay, probably not forever, but uh, that funding is certainly getting cut. Maybe the program ends in the early 90s. Who knows? And look, if it did end in the early 90s, I'm gonna tell you something. This would have been a great thing. If you were a kid who was interested in space travel in the early 2000s, and you thought shuttles were the coolest thing, me, I was that kid, you might not want to hear this, but the shuttle program was a failure. Not just a failure, it, it probably set us back decades in space exploration. If they had just cut their losses and ended the shuttle after Challenger, we probably would have been on Mars by now. Oh, what do you know? That's not my script. That's a quote by NASA Administrator Michael D. Griffin. As for Challenger, there was some fear that there was something wrong with the solid rocket boosters, especially the O-rings. And while the SBRs were being re 
redesigned, shuttle launches continued on as normal, despite there being a real fear of what failure could bring. The entire launch around the Challenger was just weird. The morning of the shuttle launch had temperatures of 30 degrees Fahrenheit. That was so cold, there were icicles on the shuttle itself. Yet, NASA was still adamant about going ahead. They delayed the launch multiple times and refused to delay anymore, which is kind of strange for NASA to be honest. Despite warnings from multiple engineers, despite the O-rings being a known problem, why did the higher-ups still go through with it? What was so important that day for NASA to have a civilian in space? This momentous occasion in American history. Why did the Challenger need to launch on January 28th, 1986? It's kind of strange for NASA to do, to be honest. They never had an issue before delaying a launch. What was just so important about this day for NASA to have the first civilian in outer space? Holy shit, did Reagan cause the Challenger disaster? Before her death, Krista McAuliffe confided in a personal friend that she felt Reagan was using her, but she felt that what she was doing benefited education, so she went along with it. Ronald Reagan personally announced the Teacher in Space program. It seemed to be something that he was actually very interested in. He was never a very hands-on president. If anything, he let those under him make many of the major decisions. And because of that, it makes it very complicated knowing just what he approved and what he didn't. This is Dr. William Robert Graham. Graham had a PhD in electrical engineering, and in 1980 had worked on the Reagan campaign leading up to his election. Following this, he was nominated by the president to be chairman of the General Advisory Committee on Arms Control, a stint that lasted for three years before he got another promotion. In 1985, Graham was nominated as the Deputy Administrator of NASA, soon to be the sole administrator following some internal politics and the resignation of James M. Beggs. Graham was a Reagan lackey. There's no other way to describe him. There isn't much evidence on how much he took orders from the White House, but there is a lot of proof that he made most of his decisions to impress the guy in charge, the guy who gave him his job. Whenever the story of the Challenger is told, it's always that NASA higher-ups just had to launch on that day. Those mysterious higher-ups. It was Graham. We know that Graham had the last say on if the launches went through or not. In fact, he called off the previous launch on the 27th. Yet, despite recommendations from not only his own engineers, but also contractor engineers who worked on the SBRs, he went through anyway. McAuliffe even told the same friend the day before she died that NASA was adamant about launching on the 28th, no matter what. So the question really is why? Why was the 28th the final straw? When the Challenger exploded, the White House was asked if the date of the Union Address might have spurred the shuttle to launch. The White House press in response called these allegations sick and dangerous rumors. So how linked was the Challenger to the State of the Union Address? It's a question that really has no answer, or at least an answer I'm not going to say with 100% confidence. It makes sense that the Reagan administration would want to talk about this private citizen that was currently orbiting the Earth as sort of a own to the Soviets. We only have a few breadcrumbs to go off of thanks to time and the investigation that came afterward. According to Malcolm McConnell, author of Challenger A Major Malfunction, he was told by a staff member that it was common knowledge JPL had been told to clear a communications channel that was being used for the unmanned Voyager spacecraft so that the president could call Challenger during the State of the Union speech. The morning of the launch, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal by Jane Mayer where she reported that the president was going to pause his speech and turn everyone's attention to a screen which would show the hero. This mysterious hero was never brought up again after the explosion. We never found out who this hero was, as no hero was ever presented at the 1986 State of the Union. The Reagan administration remained adamant that this was always the case that there wasn't going to be a mention of Krista McAuliffe in the speech at all. A week later though, there did still happen to be a mention of the science experiment that a student made that was on the Challenger when it exploded. So they were going to mention the science experiment, but not the teacher. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going, we don't need roads.
This isn't definitive proof of a cover-up at all. In fact, you can say it's strange to suggest the president would stop his speech and call somebody during the State of the Union. Perhaps a mention during the speech, sure, but this type of action is a little bombastic. It is Reagan, he is always known for his showmanship, so it's kind of in character. Like, hey, look, there's that teacher I put in a space with that program I started. This is all hearsay, though. What the speech on January 28th was supposed to be has never been disclosed. All we have to go off of is that the Reagan administration's official stance on the Challenger disaster is that it in no way had ties to the State of the Union address the very same day. There was never going to be a mention of a hero in 1986, and Reagan never planned to mention the program that he started. So let's move away from the State of the Union then. What if it wasn't that? Could there have been something else on January 28th that made it an important cutoff date? Well, apparently there was. NASA's schedules for the shuttle were strict. They either happened on time or not at all. We know what the planned schedule for the Challenger was. One of the most important aspects of the entire mission was for Krista to teach a lesson in space. This lesson, just like the Challenger launch, would be broadcasted to schools across the nation. This lesson really seemed to be the culmination and entire point of her being there in the first place. That inspiration to get into STEM that the administration hoped for. The lesson was planned for day four. Now, the Challenger was originally meant to launch on Monday, January 27th, but because of the delay, they had to push it to January 28th. Four days from then would be a Friday, a weekday where millions of kids are still in school. It's cutting it close, but it's still manageable. If the shuttle had to be delayed again, though, then that lesson would be scheduled for a day where no kids are in school. This lesson might be entirely scrapped. Even if there were no plans for the State of the Union address, this lesson was well known and anticipated. Is it so insane to imagine that NASA would give the go-ahead just to remain on schedule? I don't think so. This was an organization which was playing it pretty fast and loose with safety. In his book Challenger Revealed, Richard C. Cook described NASA as being pretty confused when the explosion happened. Like, they had protocols for when a disaster occurred, but it was like nobody expected one to actually happen. You know, perhaps there's no single reason for why the Challenger had to go on the 28th. Maybe there's just a bunch of small ones. It was optimal for many parties involved to launch. I don't believe Reagan personally picked up a phone and ordered the shuttle to take off. Administrations are big, and such a decision probably came down to some middleman or public relations figure that just wanted to boost the president's image. Nobody in the White House probably even knew about the potential danger of launching in such conditions. Who knows what an O-ring is? I don't, that's nerd crap. But there was very clearly somebody who should have known better though, William Graham. Not that William Graham. Yeah, there's two William Grahams that knew Reagan. He was the one where the buck stopped, he had the power to delay the launches, and he didn't. We will truly never know how involved the Reagan administration was with forcing the Challenger to launch. Honestly, I started this entire rabbit hole because the concept just seemed so insane. This video was supposed to be a dumb April Fool's joke about a Muppet exploding. Now I'm like a month late and I look like an insane person. In reality, I personally believe that the story is far less dramatic than that. In my opinion, I think Graham decided to launch just to keep his boss happy. Graham went on to serve a lengthy career of five months as NASA administrator before resigning and leaving forever. He dabbled in being the science advisor to the president until 1989, before then going into the private sector. A fate that anybody familiar with the federal government would have saw coming a mile away. He wasn't the only cause or reason, of course. There were many conditions that led to the Challenger exploding. It just so happens that some of those conditions were much more individualistic than others. Sometimes it takes something blowing up in everyone's face for things to get back on track. Good thing nothing bad will ever happen to a shuttle, ever again. Frankly, after doing so much research for this thing, I've lost a lot of respect for NASA, you have no idea. This entire story is made up of so much hearsay and rumors that I just didn't bother telling you 90% of it. There's always something some reporter said or some info removed from a memo. This is something you either take at face value or you're already arguing with me in the comments. A lot of people made a lot of really bad decisions, just like using taxpayer dollars to rocket a yellow bird into outer space. Which brings us back to the entire point of this video, Muppet Tragedy. The Big Bird Challenger fact is not new. 
It's brought up on the internet all the time, actually. It's just this dark joke of how Big Bird was one step away from being a part of a major disaster. And that's why I even started this video. After all of this, if Big Bird, a Muppet, had been chosen to go to space instead of the first private citizen, I don't think NASA would have pushed the Challenger launch on the 28th. Big Bird wouldn't have been shown off at the State of the Union. Nor would he have taught kids in school. They might have even waited until there was warmer and safer conditions. Maybe the O-rings wouldn't have been frozen. I guess my point here is, and the point of this whole video, is that if Big Bird had been on the Challenger instead, it probably wouldn't have exploded. 